Hi guys, my name is Tensor. Welcome to the Go Design Pattern Tutorial Series. In today's video, we're going to talk about the decorator pattern. Some of you may have heard this term decorator before, and you may have even used it in other programming languages such as Python, Java, and TypeScript. And of course, you can use decorators in Go. Now, decorators essentially allow you to wrap existing functionality and then inject your own custom functionality on top of that functionality. And we're able to get away with this because functions in Go are first class, which means that we can pass functions to variables, we can pass functions to other functions, and we can of course return functions from functions. To demonstrate the decorator pattern, I've created a function here called pi. This function just takes in a value and then it uses that value to approximate the number of pi. So we create a channel of float 64 here, and then we iterate from 0 to n, which is the number that we're passing in here. And the higher this number is, the better our approximation will be. For each iteration, we'll spawn a new go routine on this anonymous function here. And the anonymous function will take in our channel and it will take in our k value as a float 64, and it will run this calculation and then pass it into the channel. Now down here we have our result variable, which will start at 0, 0. Then we'll iterate again from 0 all the way up to n, and we'll take all of the values from our channel and then just increment our result with them. After we're done cleaning out all of the values from the channel, we'll go ahead and return this result from this function. So I'm going to call fmt println pi with 1000 inside of it, and then I'm going to call it also with 50,000 inside of it, and we'll see the approximations of pi. So here you can see that our top approximation gave us 3.1425, and then our bottom approximation is a bit more accurate, giving us 3.141. Now let's say we want to take this function and wrap it inside of a logger in such a way that the logger will tell us how long it took to execute the function. Well, to accomplish this, we can go ahead and use what's called a decorator function. Now to start out, we can create a function called wrap logger, and this will take in a function that takes in an integer and a float 64, which is the type of our pi function down here. And then it will return that same type of function. And actually to make this easier to read, we can alias this function type as pi func, and then just replace these declarations. So this wrap logger function will take in a pi func, which is just a function that takes in an int and returns a float 64, and then it will return a pi func type. While we're at it, let's also add a logger variable here, which will take in a reference to log.logger, which will allow us to specify how we want our logger to actually function. So then inside of this function, we'll return an anonymous function that takes in an integer and returns a float 64. And in the body of this function, we can then create our logger and also execute the pi function. And notice that we can just take the function that we're passing into wrap logger and just call it on n. And this in essence would just give us our pi function back, except it would also have the logger scope to it as well. The body of this function is going to get a tad more complicated when we add the actual logger because we want this logger to execute as soon as our function starts and also when the function ends. And we can accomplish this by using the defer keyword and then creating yet another anonymous function. Our inner anonymous function is where we're getting the timestamp for when the function execution starts. This takes in a value of time.time, .time, and the value is being passed in here. So this is being executed immediately with time.now as the argument. But because it's being deferred, this will not complete execution until the end of this outer function body because it's being called down here. Inside of it, 
we're calling logger print f we're putting in that it took a time since value which is just a time comparison between time now and then the current time so this will give us the amount of time that it took to execute the function then we can see the value n that we passed in and then we can also see the result and this result value is why we have this second anonymous function being wrapped around the defer call. So you can see here that the second anonymous function takes in a value n int, and then it also returns a float 64. But because we want to access that return value, we name it as result. And what that does is it allows us to gain access to the return value of our function in this closure and then we can use it in our logger here. In this fn function that we're creating, we'll call fun, which is the argument function that we're passing in here, which will be our pi function. So this will start the execution of our pi function. And then outside of the fn declaration, we call fn with n. Once we've defined this decorator function, we can now go down to our main function and just call it and we call it on our pi function and then we pass in the logger that we want to add and this is just a call to log new with os standard out because we want it to print to our console and then we want it to start with the word test this will give us back a function which we can invoke with the value that we want to pass into our pi function so here i'm passing in 100,000, and then this will go through our logger and our pi function and we'll have all of this behavior attached to this new composite function. We can see when we go ahead and run this that we get that it took 660 milliseconds with n100,000 and the result was 3.141602, etc. This decorator pattern is especially useful when you want to create middleware for like a server or a client or a sort of like RESTful API. And in fact, the HTTP library in Go uses the decorator pattern quite a lot. Now let's say we want to add a second decorator. Currently we have the logger decorator and this gives us a new function and we can chain it together with another decorator to add more functionality to our pi function. If we wanted to say call pi 100,000 and then call it again, we would have to go through both executions. And so it makes sense to create a cache decorator function. So to create the cache function, we'll create a function called wrap cache. This will take in a pi func type and then our cache, which will be a sync map type. And this is just a map primitive that is thread safe. And the reason why we want to use this primitive is because our pi function is using a lot of go routines. And then like our wrap logger function, our wrap cache function will also return a pi func type. Inside of our cache function, we'll again return a function that takes in an integer and a float 64. And we'll again create another anonymous function that also takes in an integer and a float 64. We'll first define the key that we want to add to our map. So this will be the key that we're, and we can use fmt sprintf, pass in the value n, and put it into a string of n equals with the n number inside of it. Then we can call to our cache, and we can call load on our key to check to see if that key is already populated in our sync map. And this will return the value and then a boolean and if this boolean comes back as true then we want to return this value as a float 64. Otherwise we want to continue call our function our pi func on n get the result and then store that result inside of our cache map with the key and then return the result from this function. And then of course, because we need to return a float 64 from this anonymous function, we'll call this fn function on n and return it. And now we can come down to our main function, call wrap cache on pi, and then pass in a reference to the sync map that we want to use as our cache, and then take that function f and call wrap logger on it, which will give us a function g, 
which we can then call. And this function g will have both our cache and our logger behavior on top of our pi function. First, when we run it with 100,000, the time it takes is 706 milliseconds. Then we run it on, say, 20,000, and it takes 66 milliseconds. And then again, when we run it on 100,000, it takes zero seconds because it gets the value from the cache. One thing that you want to keep in mind with this current implementation is that you want to wrap the cache on top of pi first and then wrap the logger on top of both of those functions. If you don't do that, then the cache function, if it returns a value, will not actually put that value into the logger. And to kind of explain this, let's take a look at the actual structure of our functions. So we have pi in the middle, then we have logger, and then we have cache. So when we call wrap cache, the fun function here is a combination of the logger and the pi function. When we come to this if statement, we return the value with type float 64, but we never actually execute the fun function, which means that we don't actually execute the logger either. And so this return value just gets returned from our function, but it doesn't actually go into our logger. If, however, we have the logger on the outside, then it doesn't really matter if we get a value returned in that way or if we get a value returned by invoking the pi function. One of the cooler features of the decorator pattern is that you can reuse all of the decorators many times over many different objects, so long as those objects follow the same pattern. So this divide function which I've created here, which is pretty simple, it just takes a number, which is an integer, and then divides it by two, and then casts that value as a float 64, follows the same type declaration as our pi function. And so this divide function can also be wrapped inside of the cache function and our logger function. So instead of passing in pi, we pass in divide, and then we wrap the value here f in the wrap logger, which then gives us this function g, and we can of course call it with different values. And now you can see that we get back the calculations of pi, and then we also get back the division calculations. So, so long as the function follows this type declaration, we can attach all of these decorators to it. And this is a very flexible idea because you can really create a ton of different functions which can follow these types of patterns. And also because of the way that we're composing all of these functions together, the main functions do not actually care about how the decorators are structured and vice versa. So our wrap cache decorator just deals with the cache and our wrap logger decorator just deals with the logger and only they know how the implementation of the cache or the logger actually is whereas the divide and the pi functions don't really care what that implementation is. And so even if I radically change wrap cache and wrap logger, so long as the general pattern is held, they should still work on these functions. All right, guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. If you did, feel free to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the box below. And if you dislike this video, then by all means, downvote it as much as you like. If you want to catch more videos on Go design patterns, then I recommend you click on the notification bell. Have a good night.